All right, all right. Let's give a round of applause to the Lord. We're going we're gonna to get into the Word today, and I'm really excited to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Mike, and um, as Dan so lovingly introduced me, um, the two of us are friends. Uh, I have the mic now, so he, has, he, has, he can't get me back, right? I can just roast him however I want to, but I'm going to be easy on him right now. Um, but like I said, my name is Mike, and I am so blessed to be here right now. I'm so excited. I want to start out by saying hello to the online campus. Welcome. We're so glad that you're all tuning in. Facebook, um, online platform, we're glad that you're here. Um, also, I want to make sure that everyone's equipped with their, with their Bible. So go ahead and raise your hand if you need a Bible, and our ushers will go ahead and give you one. Uh, we're going to be getting into the Word today. So I'd love if you are all here to follow along um, as, we, as we just dive in. We're going to pray, and then I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be getting into today. Father God, we thank you so much for your goodness, for your grace. We thank you for your word. God, I pray right now that you would, you would speak through me, God, that it wouldn't be me speaking, but it would be your spirit speaking through me, Lord, and that each person individually here would hear what they need to hear in order for their lives to be changed, for them to be transformed to become more like your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, so um, excited about this series. This is really cool. This split series is awesome. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my family before we get started. Uh, I'm, I'm married. I've been married for a little over 10 years, and I know some of you are like, wow, you got married at 14? Uh, <laughs> well, no, I didn't. I got married at 20 years old, and um, I have three amazing kids. I have a, an eight-year-old son, a seven-year-old daughter, and a five-year-old son. So I have a house that's full of joy and uh, amazingness and chaos, and it's been like a whirlwind. Uh, it's been so great. But we're going to be getting into this series today with Split, and it's really cool because I know the pastors have been speaking the last, uh, you know, couple weeks about, about Peter specifically. And Peter's a really cool character because Peter's like the guy who, he, he's that one that we can all relate to in many ways. Do you notice how almost every TV show that you ever watch, there's like a lot of crazy, funny characters, but then there's that one person, it's either a guy or a girl, and they're just kind of like, they're just the one who's responding to everything that's happening. And you can relate to that character, right? So if you watch The Office, that's like Jim. Okay, Jim just watches all the crazy stuff happen, and you get to kind of live, watch the show through his eyes, or Pam, right? Um, so you get to relate in that way. And Peter has been going through uh, so much stuff in the Gospels, and, and now you get to see his responses to it. For a while there, he was, he was following all the rules, trying to do everything right. Okay, that's probably, that's probably this guy, the grumpy guy, right? And then you have, then you have the rule breaker. You have the, the Peter that's like kind of, on a whim, doing whatever it is, the first thing that comes to his mind. And he's, he's like throw, closing his eyes and throwing a rock and just trying to hit a target. Right? Like I think of Peter as the rule breaker when I, when I look at him cutting that man's ear off. Do you guys remember that story? Like Jesus is, is about to be taken to be crucified and Peter's like, no, you're not going to do it and slices a guy's ear off. It's like, what? who told you to do that? That was not a good idea at all. You know, and Peter kind of just does whatever or he's at the Mount of Transfiguration. Like there's this beautiful moment and he's up on the mountain, and Jesus is in this glorified state, and Moses shows up, and Elijah shows up. Like, how amazing would that have been? These prophets that he's been reading about, and he's like, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to do the first thing that comes to my mind, and I'm going to build an altar for everyone. And Jesus is like, nah, man, you're messing up. And, and he kind of bre he just breaks the rules. And so that's probably this guy. You know, he's having fun breaking the rules, but, you know, he's, he's, it's only going to last for so long, because breaking the rules can only last so long. Um, so, but we're going to be talking about Peter at his best today. And Peter at his best is Peter in relationship with Jesus. It's Peter in obedience to Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to talk about. Like I said, I have three kids. My youngest name is Jack, and we call him Jack-Jack, right? Like kind of influenced by the Incredibles a little bit, little Jack-Jack. And he's like that Sour Patch kid. Like first he's sour, then he's sweet. He's the kid that'll like break something, and he'll scream, he'll throw a tantrum. And he's the kid that'll like snuggle with us and give us the most affection and love. And like, we just love that about him so much. And then we have my daughter who's like so sassy. She's like 15 girls all put into one, right? She's got so much sass and so much attitude and so much love. And she's, she's a dancer, she does ballet, and she's an artist, and she's just so incredible. And then we have my son, Elijah, who's our oldest. And he's the one who's our obedient child, 
right? Like we'll tell him to do something. He just does it. He doesn't even think about it. Like we, we'll tell all of our kids, it's like, you know, 745, we're getting ready for bedtime. We're like, everyone, PJ's on in your bed. You know, and then my wife and I are cleaning up from dinner. We're doing whatever we're doing. And 15 minutes goes by and we hear kids playing and we're like, everyone get to bed. We're like, where's Elijah? He's been in his bed for 15 minutes, right? He got his PJs on and he's been laying in his bed. He's just that obedient child. And we're going to be talking about Peter in obedience today and how he responds um, to, to the Lord Jesus Christ in obedience. And we're going to be looking at the book of Acts 11. Um, if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles to Acts 11, verse 1, right after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts and I was listening online to um, Pastor Dan, who just did our, our host moment here, about his, his message about Peter rejecting the Gentiles from coming to the dinner table. If you were here, uh, you may have heard that message. Um, there was a dinner that they were having. They, basically, there's two different types of people in the world. There's Jews and there's Gentiles, right? You can say that about anything, right? You're either a potato or you're not a potato, right? It's true. But you're either a Jew or you're a Gentile, which means you're not a Jew. And so... For a, for a long time there, the Jews were God's just, I mean, they're still God's chosen people, but the Jews were the only ones who were really in relationship with God, and the Gentiles were like unclean. They weren't allowed to, to, to come into the practices of the Jewish people. And so Peter was, you know, influenced by this cultural pressure and didn't allow the Gentiles to come to the table, which, which stopped them from having communion, which stopped them from coming, having, you write the Lord's Supper together. And we're going to read about a time where the, the Jews were once again trying to pressure Peter and Peter responds in obedience to God. So Acts 11.1 1 says, Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the, in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. And the next few ver verses talk about his, his vision. He has this crazy, like, Ezekiel-style vision of the Lord. And then in verse 11, he picks up after the vision, says, And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which they were, sent, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered a man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed the Lord Jesus, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Okay, so lots going on here. But like I said, there's this dinner. There's this opportunity where, where they're saying, we're gonna have a party. We're all gonna come together, right? Um, and and we're, gonna, we're gonna worship the Lord together. And, but, but they're like, but, but the Gentiles heard the word of God. What, what are we gonna do about that? And Peter's like, I don't know. And Peter has a vision. And then all of a sudden an angel comes to him and says, go preach to these people. And Peter preaches to these people and they receive the Holy Spirit. It's kind of cool. In 1 Corinthians 12, the Bible says that we were all baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ. When we put our faith in Jesus, when we believe in him, we're all technically baptized into the body. We all become one which is amazing. It shows that no matter what your age is, no matter what your race is, no matter what your gender is, we can all be one body. It's what unites us. It was a unifying event, becoming a believer. And Peter's saying, man, if the Gentiles are receiving the Holy Spirit, who am I to stand in the way? All right? That's a pretty impactful thing that he says here in verse 17, where he says, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Peter realized, I'd be getting in God's way if I told the Gentiles not to come. So he responded in obedience, okay? He responded in surrender. When I look at Jesus' life, I used to think, and this is still true, but I used to think that Jesus' life was defined by surrender, or, or not surrender, sacrifice. But it really, is, it's, it's, it's defined by obedience and surrender. Jesus didn't do anything that the Father didn't tell him to do, right? If you lived your life from birth till death, 
Every single time the Lord asked you to do something, you did it. That's what Jesus' life looked like. He only did what the Father told him to do. He always responded in perfect obedience. Okay, there's like some worship songs and there's some, some books that talk about giving God permission. And, and some people really relate to that. But the truth is, is that you can't really give permission to a king, right? If a king says, I command you to do this, you say, all right, I'll give you permission to follow that command. That doesn't make any sense. The only thing we could respond in is in surrender. We need to recognize that this is God speaking to us and we can respond in surrender to what God's calling us to do. So Peter was a rule follower. He was a rule breaker. But Peter was at his best when he just listened to and obeyed the voice of God. So what I want to talk about a little bit today is I want to look at a couple different stories that happen throughout the Gospels where Peter responds in direct obedience to Jesus Christ. So we talked about the transfiguration on the mount, him cutting the soldier's ear off, him rejecting the Gentiles at the table. Today we're going to talk about his relationship with Jesus and how Jesus called him to do something and he responds in perfect obedience to what God God calls him to do. So let's go ahead and let's look at Matthew chapter 4 verse 18. We'll put it up here on the screen. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Okay, this is a a familiar story, but notice how you'll see that immediately they left their nets. They didn't wait. They didn't hang around. They didn't say, well, you know what, let's give it a couple days and we'll think about it and we'll see, we'll get back to Jesus, right? We'll call him back. They immediately left their nets and followed him. They left their livelihood. They left everything and went after him. I thought for a while that this was, G- that this was Peter's salvation moment, right? This is, this is when he first put his faith in Jesus. This is when he first believed in Jesus Christ. But this was actually, he, he had already believed in Jesus. There was a, a story in John 2 where you can see that Peter had already witnessed Jesus and, and his miracles and believed in him. But this was Peter choosing to follow Jesus, which is point one. This was his first step in obedience. Peter followed Jesus. And I want to uh, encourage you all, this is an opportunity we have to follow Jesus. Some of you might believe in him. You might say, I believe in, in Jesus. I believe that he died for me. I believe that I'm a sinner. But my question is, are you following him? Are you walking with him in discipleship? Okay, he, he immediately left his nets and followed Jesus. He didn't wait around. I think what I'm not telling you to do is don't ever wait. Because sometimes there's a time to wait, right? But when we're waiting, what are we waiting for? We're waiting to hear from God. So when we hear from God, the waiting's done. Now it's time for action. It's time to move, right? Some of you in this situation right right now might be in, in the situation where you're hanging out with a group of friends maybe that God doesn't want you hanging out with. You're spending time with some people. You're going out, right? You're going out on, on Friday nights. You're going down to PB or downtown or wherever you're going. And the, <laughs> right, all the, all the spots. And the Lord's like, you need to stop doing that. You need to like start a connect group in your home and like start hanging out with some people that, are gonna, that you're gonna be able to like grow in fellowship with. That doesn't mean like, well, I'll wait and see if that's, that holds itself true in time. No, it's time to move. It's time to take action now. Don't wait around on that, right? I think of like, one, one classic story in scripture of someone waiting was Jonah. God's like, Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach to these people. And Jonah's like, maybe I'll just wait this one out. Maybe God will forget about it. You know what I mean? I'm going to take a boat the opposite direction and see if God will just forget about it. It didn't really work out for him. He ended up getting vomited out by a giant fish onto the shore of Nineveh, right? God's like, I'll get you there. You're going to do it, right? It's going to take, it's going to take some pain and some suffering, but I'm going to get you there. How much better would it have been if he took the boat to Nineveh and said, and just went there? Peter responded in obedience when the Lord called him. And I think about what if Peter would have waited? What if, what if, well, it was Simon at the time. What if Simon would have said, let me get back to you on that, Jesus. I don't know about this whole fisher of men thing. I don't know how I'm going to make money. I don't really have a, like, what's the retirement benefit, like, package look like? I, I, need, I need to know a little bit more details. Who am I going to be working with, you know? Uh, starts asking those questions. Jesus might have been like, you know what? That's cool. Uh, let me call the next guy in the next boat. I'll call you, Peter, and I'll build my, my church on you. Maybe, right? It's, it's, we need to respond in obedience. When Jesus calls, let's respond. So, so point one was that Peter followed Jesus in obedience. The next story I want to look at is, is, is one of my favorites. 
And it's in Matthew 14, if you want to just flip over there. We're going to be in Matthew for the next couple stories, so just go ahead and hold your thumb in Matthew. Matthew 14, verse 24. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? So this is a crazy story. Okay, they're out on a boat. The 12 disciples are on a boat. And they see a shadowy figure out in the distance walking on the water. I mean, I would be terrified as well. I mean, even just being on a boat and it's kind of dark and stormy, you're already scared, let alone seeing like the silhouette of a human being on the water. Super terrifying. I don't know what Jesus was doing, if he was just being funny. Like, it doesn't really talk about a purpose of why he did it. He was just walking around on the ocean, like cool, or the sea, right? It's pretty amazing. And Peter says, you know what, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. And then once, there we go. Jesus then responds with a command, come. And Peter responds in obedience and steps out of the boat. He walks on the water a few steps, and then he gets a little scared. He looks around, he sees the winds, the waves, and he starts sinking. And Jesus says that, oh, you have little faith. And I think, man, Peter, Peter didn't have enough faith, but then I think there was 11 guys in the boat that had less faith than Peter, right? They didn't get out of the boat. They were safe. They were dry. They were totally fine. It was Peter that started to trust Jesus and get out of the boat, right? That's my next point, is that Peter trusted Jesus. Now, trust is one of those things that's, like, we saw that video of the, of the guy who flipped the coin every morning, and his day was determined by whether or not he's, you know, the coin goes heads or tails, Trust is not something that you either trust or you don't. Okay, like pregnancy is you either have it or you don't, right? You're either pregnant or you're not. How pregnant? 100% pregnant, right, is the answer, right? Like you either are or you aren't, you know? And, and so when it comes to trust, though, that's not how it works. Trust is like you can ask someone, do you trust your wife or do you trust your boyfriend or do you trust your babysitter? Do you trust your employer? It's going to change over time, isn't it? Trust them a little bit. You trust them a little bit more, you trust them a lot, right? Like when my mother-in-law watches my kids, I'm like, yeah, my my wife made it to adulthood without dying. You know, she'll probably do a good job with my kids too. You know, I trust her a lot. And so there's varying levels of trust. It's a muscle. We have to exercise it. And Peter was willing to take a step of faith to exercise that trust muscle, right? To respond in obedience and step out there. He ended up walking on water. Peter did. Like it's one thing for Jesus to, Peter walked on water. Jesus will ask us to do some things that kind of don't make sense in the world, right? It don't make sense in in our popular culture. Like one of the things I think about is like giving to the church, like giving financially, giving money to the church. It's like, why would you do that? If you met with a financial planner, they'd be like, no, you're way, you're way better off investing that money. Invest it into a, a Roth IRA or into your 401k or put it into um, ret- or a, house, a house or something. Use an investment. And the Lord says, well, trust me in this and watch what happens. And when you trust him, God does some miraculous things, right? It's pretty cool. Uh, how, about, how about if you're like dating someone? You know, there's probably some dating couples in here. You're dating someone and it's like, you know what? The Bible is telling, the Lord is telling me to wait until we're married to move in together. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't even know who she is. I don't even know who he is. I've never lived with her. I've never lived with him. Like, what if he leaves the toilet seat up all the time? I don't know if I want to live with that and marry that, right? What if he doesn't know how to handle money? What if he, like, there's all these what ifs. How about if we move in together, we'll save a lot of money, right? Then we'll have one mortgage, we'll have one rent, we'll be able to save together, kind of test this whole thing out, and then we'll get married. And the Lord's like, I know it doesn't make sense in the world's eye, but just trust me, watch what happens. You'll end up walking on water, right? Something crazy is going to happen. The Lord's going to bless it. Do something incredible, but you have to be willing to exercise that trust muscle. You got to be willing to step out and try it. Uh, I know, 
especially like I'm looking around at, at a lot of you and I see you know, a lot, of, a lot of people that are probably around my age. And I think like I'm scrolling through Facebook and Instagram right now and all I see are Kanye albums, right? You guys there? You see that? All I see is Kanye's new album. And I know some of you are like, gosh, I can't believe this pastor's talking about Kanye. I pro-, like I told my, my wife's like, please don't talk about Kanye. I'm like, I have to, um, <laughs> right? There's the, there's the You My Chick-fil-A song. There's so much ridiculousness. But, but yet he releases an album where he's where he's honoring the Lord in the album. If you've listened to it, like every single song is like glorifying Jesus Christ. What? Like, what are you doing, Kanye? Like, you're not gonna make more money this way, right? Like, this is no way this makes it. You're gonna be mocked, you're gonna be made fun of, but he's like, you know, I'm gonna take a stand, I'm gonna do it. Kanye's like attempting to follow Jesus and walk on water. It's kind of crazy. And like, what is Jesus calling you to do right now? What is he, how is he asking you to step out in obedience to trust him? There's something right? Each one of us has something here. This isn't the message for the person sitting next to you, right? This is a message for each and every one of us. There's something he's calling us to do, to take a step of faith, each and every one of us. The last thing I want to I talk about um, is Peter's, another, another time where Peter responded in obedience, and this is going to be in Matthew 16, and we'll put this up on the screen. You can flip there if you want to. Verse 13, it says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So this was a, this is a really cool story here because we're, we're talking about Peter only did good things really when he responded directly to Jesus' call. And this is the first time where it's like Jesus didn't really help him out. He was like, Jesus said, who do, who do people say that I am? And they're like, well, he's John the Baptist or, or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter finally got it right. Peter finally did something on his own that was right. And, and, and Jesus is like, Nice try, Peter. It was actually my father that revealed that to you, who's in heaven. Like, it's still, you don't get credit for it. You know what I mean? My father still gave you that one as an attaboy. Like, Peter had to listen to the father and respond in obedience to make that declaration. But that declaration was a confession. He confessed Jesus as the Christ, which that's going to be our, our, our closing point here. As Jesus is, or as Peter's act of obedience in confessing Jesus as the Christ. This is, this, is, this is awesome because I know we, we have a baptism coming up. Um, I know Dan was just talking about that. And baptism is a really cool opportunity for you to confess to others that Jesus is the Christ. One of, one of my favorite like, analogies that I could think of for, for confession is, is marriage. Okay, I know that, like, how many of you are married in here? You like raise your hand up? Okay, we got like, like maybe a little more than half of you in here. Okay, so, so maybe you're not married, maybe you're dating, but when you think about like your, your dating relationship, you're still kind of getting to know that person. So that could be kind of like your relationship with Jesus. Like, I believe in you, but I don't really know if I can trust you yet. And usually it's that course of time where you're dating, you're getting to know them a little bit, but maybe you're even a little bit embarrassed by them. Right? You ever been embarrassed by your boyfriend or girlfriend? Right? Like, they do some weird stuff. I mean, it's bound to happen, right? Like, you grew, up in a, you grew up in a completely different family and household, and, like, you said a word the wrong way your whole life, and you don't even realize it until your boyfriend po- pointed it out, right? Or your girlfriend pointed it out. Weird things that we do, right? I, I remember when I was dating my, my wife, um, she, she, like, I, I used to ask her, like, do you want some juice? And I'd be pouring some juice. This was, like, out of my mom's fridge when I was a kid. Do you want some juice? She'd be like, no, I'm good. And I'd pour myself a juice. And then she'd take a sip of my juice. I'm like, no, I just asked if you wanted some juice. I don't want you drinking out of my cup. Like, I was weird about that, you know? And we had this weird thing where like, for a while there, you're kind of getting used to working out the kinks. It's the same with your relationship with Jesus. I think we think of confession as, like you have to confess and believe right away. A lot of times, confession doesn't come till later. You're not really willing to confess Jesus as Christ until you've really kind of learned to get to know him a bit. And when, once you walk down the aisle on your wedding day, all that goes out the door, right? You're no longer worried about her drinking out of your cup. And if you are, you're not going to tell it to anybody else, right? Like you're saying, I'm going to invite everybody that I know. 
I'm going to invite every single person that I know that means anything to me to stand here and be witnesses that she is mine and I am hers. And I don't care what funny thing she does, any weird thing that she does, she's mine. I'm the only one who can make fun of her. None of you can, right? Like she's mine, we're one, and we're walking together for the rest of our lives. That's confession, right? That's what it looks like to confess Jesus. If you're in school right now and you're, you're a little nervous to say that you're a Christian, it's because you're exercising that confession muscle, right? You're, you're needing to take some baby steps of faith. The same way trust isn't just binary, it's like a whole range of trust that can happen. Same thing with confession. Confession, there's a whole range of confession. You can confess Jesus to your friends, but not to your family. You can confess him to family, but not to your coworkers, right? There's all different ranges of what you can do. Peter didn't have this down perfectly. He confessed Jesus as the Christ here, but then later, remember when the rooster crowed, he denied Jesus. In one of Jesus, in, in Jesus' most uh, emotional, crucial moment of his life when he was going to the cross, he denied him. And then later, Peter goes back to a life of fishing and almost, almost to ignore everything that had happened the three years prior. All those three years where he witnessed miracles and water turning into wine and walking on water, he kind of walks away from all that and goes back to fishing. And then he sees Jesus again. The Holy Spirit comes on Peter later and he preaches and thousands of people get saved. And he welcomes the Gentiles to the table saying, yeah, this amazing vision happens. They receive the Holy Spirit. And then later he gets convinced by the Jews that the Gentiles are no longer welcome to the table. He, he like denies Jesus again in a weird way. And then later Peter ends up dying for his faith as an ultimate form of confession. He went back and forth his whole life. But yet he was exercising that muscle, taking steps of faith in order to confess Jesus as the Christ. Now, I, the, the, the crazy thing about preaching a message, especially to a group of people, I don't, I don't know all of you intimately, but the Lord does. If I were to like sit down with every one of you and have an hour long meeting and ask what's going on in your life and then try to preach a sermon, it'd be like a 25 hour sermon, right? But at the same time, God doesn't need all that. God knows exactly what's going on in your heart. God knows exactly what's going on in your situation. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. And he knows the prescription that he needs to fill in your life. And your role is simply this. Listen and obey. That's it. God's going to tell you to do something. Respond in obedience. Maybe you're saying, I don't know. God hasn't spoken to me like that. Have you opened up the word? Have you opened up the Bible and just asked him? Because he'll tell you. He'll speak to you what it is that you need to do. And your role is to respond in obedience to what he's called. And that goes for me as well. That goes for all of us, the pastors on staff here. Every single day, we get to choose whether or not we want to respond in obedience to what God has called us to do or not to, right? So I'm going to pray, and I want to pray for really two groups of people. One is I want to pray for that group of people that maybe you haven't ever put your faith in, in, in Christ. You've never chosen to believe in him. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And the second group of people is, is really just all of us in here. I want to ask that the Lord will speak to your heart about what it is that he's calling you to respond in obedience with. God's going to tell you something while we're praying. And your, your role is to respond in obedience. Some of you already know what it is. You walked in here today knowing what it was. And God's saying, like Peter, respond immediately. It's time to take that step. It's time to start that group. It's time to leave that relationship. It's time to get married. It's time to, whatever it is that God's calling you to do, it's time to take that step. God's calling you to do it. No longer let's wait. If God's calling, it's time to move. Amen? Let's pray, and we're going to give you that opportunity now. Father God, we thank you so much for your word and the life of Peter, a man that so many of us can relate to. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that lives and dwells in each one of us. Your Spirit lives in us. God, I, I thank you so much that you sent your Son, Jesus, to die for us. Lord, each and every one of us here are sinners. Your Word says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Your Word also says, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
And you say that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And if we believe in you, we won't perish, but have everlasting life. So with that being spoken now, I want to encourage anybody in here, if you have yet to put your faith in Jesus, if you've yet to believe in him, this is simple. It's just saying, I believe I'm a sinner. I believe I'm destined for death, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and rose on the third day. If you believe that today, I want to just encourage you right now that you are a new creation, that God sees you, that God loves you, and he's going to walk with you every step of that journey. And I want to pray for the second group as well, which is all of us, every single one of us in here who needs to take a step of obedience. Just like Peter, I pray that we wouldn't try to just yell out the first thing that comes to mind and just hope you bless it on the back end. I pray right now, Lord, as we ask, Lord, would you speak to us? Would you speak to our hearts right now? Tell us what it is that we need to do. God, some of us in here have been putting this off for a long time. Every week, it's the one thing that's on your mind and on your heart. Today's the day it's time to step in obedience. It's time to make that call because salvation isn't just eternal. It's also for here today. You want to save every single aspect of our lives, Lord. You want to restore relationships. God, you want to restore the brokenness in our lives, Lord. You want to heal the pain that's happened in our past. You want to restore us, every single bit of us, Lord. So I pray right now that we would respond in obedience to your call, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. We love you. We pray this in your precious name. Amen.